Okay, so let's speak about the inception. I suppose that most of you already know the movie Inception. It is uh, a movie of 2010 about uh, a group of geeks specialized uh, in a very particular type of job, uh, which is stealing information uh, from people's mind. So in the movie they ask uh, if it is also possible uh, to do the other way, so to put the kind of information uh, into another person's mind. And this concept is called Inception. Specifically, an inception is uh, the implantation of another person's idea into a target subconscious. So the question I asked, uh, and the topic of my presentation, is uh, whether it is possible uh, to make it uh, for real. And just to make things clear, I'm pretty sure that there are multiple approaches that can be taken to address this question, but the point of view that I would like to provide uh, is uh, the one of a biologist. So I would like also to explain a bit uh, the biology of memory. So I made a bit of research, and among the other papers, uh, the most important that I found uh, is this one, which is entitled uh, Inception of a False Memory by Optogenetic Manipulation of a Hippocampal Memory Embryon. The paper comes from a very important group, uh, and um, the head of the laboratory, Suzuki Tonegawa, won the Nobel Prize a bit more than 40 years ago. So let's see together what they mean uh, when they speak about the uh, inception of a false memory by optogenetic manipulation of a hippocampal memory engram. And let's start by trying to understand why they speak about uh, hippocampal memory. So what I would like you to understand is that there are different forms of memory. I have put here just a couple of examples. First, think about riding a bike. To ride a bike is a skill that probably most of us learned when we were kids. It's something that indeed involves the use of some memory, but it's a form of memory which is very difficult to consciously recollect. It's even difficult to put in words uh, what does it mean to be able to ride a bike. On the other side, think about the first date with your partner. Of that episode, uh, you remember everything, uh, all the details uh, and also all the emotions. And if you go back to that same place, uh, you will always associate it to that episode in the past. What is very interesting uh, is that we have now evidences uh, that the different forms of memory are also associated uh, to different brain systems. And the words brain systems may sound a bit unclear, but just imagine a brain system as uh, a group of different areas in the brain. So this is the reason why they speak about hippocampal memory, because the form of memory that they are manipulating uh, is mainly associated uh, to a region of the brain, which is called hippocampus. And let's see now when they speak about memory engram. And to be honest, to explain what an engram is uh, will probably take more than these 15 minutes. However, for the purpose of this presentation, uh, I think it's already a very good approximation to imagine that memory into our brains uh, can be imagined as uh, groups of neurons which are active together, also in different parts of the brain. This group of neurons, uh, also an approximation, but is what we call uh, engram. Engram is basically the word that we use in neurobiology to indicate the biological equivalent of memory. Our memory is uh, represented in our brains. And this is also why we speak about uh, memory engram. So this association between memory as a group of neurons active together is very important because if you think about that, now if we have a strategy to control neuronal activation, then we might have also the possibility of impacting on memory. And it turns out that this is actually the case. We have multiple ways uh, to control neural activity, but probably the most used one, the strongest one, 
is called uh, optogenetics. And that's why they speak about uh, optogenetic manipulation. So also to explain in details uh, how optogenetics work, uh, would probably take most of these 15 minutes. Uh, and also it was the topic of a previous 15 by 4 talk, so if you are interested, you can also watch that, in that video. For the purpose of this presentation, please keep in mind these two concepts. First of all, that optogenetics is mainly based on a molecule which is called channel rhodopsin. And this molecule has to be put into neurons through some genetic manipulation, which unfortunately I don't have time to explain. Now, channel rhodopsin is a very nice molecule because it allows uh, to control neuronal activation and this in response to blue light. Now, if you imagine that Garfield uh, is a neuron that contains chandrodoxy inside, uh, when no blue light is present, uh, Garfield behaves normally, so it's basically inactive. But if you shine blue light on it, uh, it suddenly becomes active. This is, in few words, how optogenetics work. And this is just to make you understand that it might seem that optogenetic is an easy technique, but this is actually not the case. It is a quite invasive technique. So now we understood most of the words in this title, and we should be able to understand how these scientists claim to have done an inception of a false memory. However, guys, I now have to inform you that while I, have, I was preparing this talk, mainly about this paper, a second paper came out, which is entitled Memory Formation in the Absence of Experience, and this came out just a few weeks ago, at the end of April. And to be honest, I think that this second paper is even more relevant for the question of this presentation. So at the beginning, my reaction was a bit like this, but then I stayed cool. <laughs> and I just thought that you guys would really like to know what is the state of the art of the field. So I decided to change my presentation and for a matter of time I will not anymore present the results of the previous paper and instead I will present the results of this second paper. However, the introduction of the gate is still useful also to understand this one. So follow me to understand in understanding how this scientist uh, had formed a memory in the absence of experience. And first of all, uh, let's see together this example. Think about how the memory of a positive or a negative smell is formed. Either when you force the smell, this odor, you like or dislike it, but it can also be, for example, uh, that you are eating some food and it turns out to be bad, and you feel sick. So when you will smell again the odor of this food, you will associate it to a negative experience. So this can also happen for the mouse. If you take a mouse and you make it to smell an odor, but then you also provide a small electric shock, not very strong, but strong enough that the mouse doesn't like it, the mouse associates this odor to a negative experience. So, if you represent this model to the mouse, it remembers that it might receive an electric shock, so it actively avoids this holder. So, let's see now how the memory of a positive or a negative smell is formed from a biological point of view. To form this memory, you need at least three different elements. First of all, you need to smell the holder, so you need your nose. But of course, your nose alone is not sufficient. You also have to send this information to your brain. So something has to translate this order into words that your brain understands. And this is done by some neurons, which connect your nose to your brain. And finally, you also need something that tells you whether this is a positive or a negative smell. And this is also done by your brain, and specifically by some neurons into a brain system, so a group of different brain areas, which is called the limbic system. So to summarize, 
this is uh, how the memory of a positive or a negative smell is formed. First of all, you need to smell the odor, then you need to translate it into words that your brain understand. And while these neurons are active, are translating the odor or encoding the odor, some other neurons in the limbic system has to be active and tell you whether this is positive or negative. So when the memory of the holder associated to a negative experience that was formed into the mouse brain, this is how it is encoded. So the authors were able to put chandarogopsin specifically in those neurons that encode for that order. So when you now artificially activate these neurons by shining light, the mouse gets an artificial feeling of smelling this odor. As well, they were able to put chandrodopsin specifically in those neurons that encode for a negative feeling. So when you artificially activate these neurons, the mouse gets an artificial feeling of a bad experience. You all see where I am going. If you artificially activate at the same time the neurons that encode for that order and those that encode for a negative feeling, an artificial memory is formed into the mouse brain that associates that order to a negative experience. And you know that this is true because if you then present the order, even if the mouse has never experienced it before, it has never smelled it before, it will actively avoid it. So this is indeed the formation of a memory in the absence of experience. And that here I'd like to summarize what I hope you've understood. I hope you've understood that memory manifests into different forms, and that these different forms are associated with different brain systems. I hope you've understood that engram is a word that we use to indicate the biological representation of memory into our brains. And this, to a good approximation, can be imagined as groups of neurons in our brain which are active together. I hope you understood that optogenetics is a very powerful technique which allows uh, to control neural activity. And the thanks to optogenetics and to the understanding that we have of how memory is encoded, it was possible to generate a completely artificial association between a order and a negative experience. And before concluding, I just would like to spend a couple of words uh, to explain why all this should be important. So this is basic science. I'm not claiming that this is anything translational. However, if you think about that, if we understand the basic mechanism underlying memory formation, it might be that this uh, will help us to develop new strategies uh, to treat diseases, such as, for example, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alexander. So we have uh, time for the few questions, please. Thank you. Uh, I see the future. And, uh, <clears throat> thank you very much for your talk. So, could you explain a little bit in more details how you undo this link between the neurons? So you're talking about uh, which part of the effects it could uh, have on uh, psychology or something. How do you undo the link? The link between uh, the perception and treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder yeah. or the link between two different stimuli in the brain? Which I guess are the same things. They are not. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> So concerning the first, the link between uh, inception and post-traumatic stress disorder, I'm to be honest not claiming that uh, this is possible at the moment. Uh, what I was just saying is that since post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, 
a disease uh, where a memory of a bad experience uh, is uh, feeling you problems. It might be that if you understand properly how memory is encoded, uh, you might develop some strategies to treat this disorder. But I'm not pretending that this has to be inception. However, what I can add is that there are groups that are working on post-traumatic stress disorder, and what they show is, but they're trying to do a different thing. They're trying to reactivate the memory and to extinguish it, which is not an exception. And this, by either some psychotherapy approaches or by pharmacological approaches, mainly. And for the second question, the question is if it's possible to artificially forget something. I think at the moment uh, you can't artificially forget. Nobody is, is doing that, but I might be wrong. I was thinking the inception was some positive and then this paper came out. Do <laughs> you have time for some other questions? Uh, so please, on this, on this side. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. I have a question how specific the system is. Like, uh, in the case of uh, transgenic mouse, right? Um, how do you know, or how the scientists actually could see if that was actually the order of the flower, or maybe it's the shape of the flower, maybe it's the color of the flower, maybe it's just a, a scientist? Yes. That's a very good question. Um, I had, of course, to simplify the experiment. But if you look at the paper, there are of course a lot of other controls that they do. Meaning that it's not that they are just presenting a holder to the mouse, they are taking two different holders that are different in encoding, and they show that uh, they can associate the memory to one of them and not the other at the same time. So it's specific for the holder, but just for the holder. Meaning the, 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 the real goal of the paper was actually to be able to find a system, which is the holder, um, the olfactorial system, which is simple enough, simple enough to, to do this manipulation. You can't do that for other systems of the brain. So we have time for one more question. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, hi, very nice talk. Uh, would you like to comment how the information is stored in our brain or in the neuron? So let me the question. Uh, so the question is yeah. how the information is stored in our brain. Yeah. It's about memories. Yeah. So the real answer is that we don't exactly know yet. And the bit more accurate answer is that as I say engram is I, I made a bit of simplification in saying that engram is simply a group of neurons which is a Active together, what you can imagine is that experience uh, makes changes into our brain map into multiple different levels, from molecular to network level. These changes all together, if we don't know all them, this is how memory is stored into our brain, or at least how we think that it is stored into our brain. And this to a good approximation can be imagined as patterns of neural activity within different parts of the brain. Thank you. Thank you very much.